So we're going to continue to move away from quantitative data in lesson 8.2 and really start talking about qualitative data, so not numbers but qualities. And we're going to introduce this idea of chi-squared test for independence. So this is a Greek letter chi here, not a capital X. First, I would pause the video and write down these notes. So first definition hypothesis, um, that's a statement about the unknown parameters. You talk about this a lot in science. Um, we're going to have a slightly more specific definition when we say hypothesis, but it's your what are you trying to prove? Um, and the way that you prove that is your statistical test. Um, so we're going to be talking about a few different types of statistical tests in the next few lessons. Um, and the information that you get out of that is your statistical inference. So what can you infer, infer about your statistics based on the test that you did um, before? So now, when we talk about a more specific definition of hypothesis, we're going to have two types of hypotheses. We're going to have a null hypothesis, which is represented with this H sub 0, and that's your initial hypothesis. Um, we're going to be very specific on the way that we word these. There's always going to be no difference. Your, your initial hypothesis is assuming that they're not related to each other. There's no difference between your two variables versus your alternative hypothesis, H sub 1, this is really kind of what I think of when I, what you're trying to prove. I'm trying to prove that these two are related to each other, that there, or that there is a difference between the two things that I'm comparing. Um, so we're going to be very specific with our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. The first statistical test we're going to be looking at is the chi-squared test for independence. We're going to have two chi-squared tests over the next few days. So the first one is for independence. We're using this to show whether or not they're independent of each other. On the previous slide, I explained that our null and alternative hypotheses were going to be worded very specifically. For our test for independence, our null hypothesis, we are always assuming that they're not related or they're independent of each other. Any connection or any relationship is random. It's just chance. Versus all our, our alternative hypothesis is that they are dependent on, on each other, or one is dependent on the other. So null, not related, alternative, yes related. Our critical region are those events or those situations for which our null hypothesis is rejected. So basically that we're saying that yes, they are in fact dependent on one another. Our significance level, which we denote with the Greek letter alpha, or alpha level, is the probability of event occurring in the critical region. So this is our threshold for randomness that we will accept. So the alpha levels that we usually choose are 0 0.01, so 1%, 0 0.05, 5%, or 0 0.1, 10%. So you choose an alpha level, let's say we choose 0 0.05, 5%. So if we find that the probability of the randomness is less than 5%, then we're saying that's a pretty good outcome. The, the, if it's less than 5% chance that any relationship is random, then it's probably not random. Versus if we have a probability that is higher than that, let's say we are setting our threshold at 5% and we end up with a probability of like 15%, then we're saying no, that's too random. We're going to assume that they're independent of each other. With the data that we collected, we don't have enough proof to say that they are in fact related or dependent on each other. So for the next couple of slides, I'm going to be talking about some vocabulary and some information that we need before we actually do an example. Um, just to kind of have a better idea of what this looks like, we're going to have data tables that are comparing one qualitative data value to another. So for example, I just used gender versus favorite sport. Um, so this is kind of what it talks about when it's talking about totals and rows and columns. Um, so first, I would pause the video and write down these notes. So the first is observed frequency, or F sub O. Um, so those are the values that you collected during the experiment. So for example, how many females chose tennis, how many males chose basketball, that would be your observed value. Your expected frequency, um, F sub E, are the values that you would expect via probability theory, which we'll get into probability theory next chapter. Um, but basically, if you look at the total um, amount of data that you collected, what would you expect each of these groups to be? So the way that you calculate any expected value is you would calculate the row total times the column total divided by the total total. Um, so row total would be like total number of females, column total would be like total number of males, oh, sorry, tennis, and then total total would be total people surveyed. Um, degrees of freedom is, which we represent with this letter V, 
is how many values have free choice, so basically how much variability you have in your data. Um, and the way that we calculate it is the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. So if we were doing this example here, we have two rows, so it would be one, two minus one, and then we have three columns, so this would be two, so one times two would be a two. Um, test our chi-squared test statistic, which we represent with a chi-squared calc, that's if you're doing this by hand, um, which you would only really do on your internal assessment. On exams, we're always going to calculate it with our graphing calculator. The way that you would do it on your, the way you do it by hand is you take every one of these expected values and you subtract the, excuse me, the observed values and then you subtract the expected values so you find how different they are, square it, and then divide it by the expected value, and then uh, add all of those up. Remember, the sigma means sum. Your critical value is the value based on your significant level, uh, your significance level, and your degrees of freedom. So this is our region where we say it's acceptable to be this random. Um, again, this would be something that you're only using if you're calculating it by hand. Otherwise, you would just use your alpha level. And then our probability value or our p-value is the probability that the result being observed is true or that it, it's random, basically. Um, so again, we're going to be using our graphing calculator for this, and this is what we're going to be using to compare to our alpha levels. So again, out of context, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but just write down the vocabulary so that we can use it in our examples. So this information on this slide is how we actually get our final answer at the end of our test. What, what does it even mean? Um, and there's two different ways that we can look at it depending on the information that you have. So when you accept the null hypothesis, so you're saying that they are independent of each other, IB will accept the term accept. Um, but a lot of statistics courses won't. For example, AP statistics, you're supposed to use the phrase do not reject. Basically, you don't have enough data to prove that they aren't independent to each other, so we're not going to reject it. It's not quite the same thing as saying we accept it. Um, and there's two different ways that we look at, about, look at it. Same thing with rejecting the null hypothesis or saying, yes, we, we like the alternative hypothesis. They are, in fact, dependent on each other. And it depends on what information you have. So. Your chi-squared test statistic, most of the time you're going to get this from your graphing calculator. Your critical value, this would have to be given to you um, on an exam. Otherwise, you need a data table um, to calculate this. So if your chi-squared value is less than your critical value, then you do not reject the null hypothesis. Or if your probability, probability value is greater than your alpha level. This is the one you're going to use mo most often is the second one. So the probability is higher than your threshold. We do not reject the null hypothesis. Opposite direction for rejecting the null hypothesis, if your chi-squared test statistic is greater than your critical value, or again, this is the one that you'll use more often, your p-value, your probability that they're random, is smaller than your alpha threshold. This is what we're really looking for. OK, so let's try an example. Hopefully, this will kind of bring everything together. So 80 people were asked for their favorite genre of music, pop, classical, folk, or jazz, and also their gender. Um, so they put us in a da data table here, gender versus favorite music type. And a chi-squared test for independence was carried out at the 1% significance level. So they're giving us this in an exam that always have to give you your alpha level. Um, so our alpha level is 0 0.01. So the, the threshold we're setting for randomness is 1%. They're also getting, giving us the critical value, because otherwise you would have to have a table for this. Um, so they're giving us the critical value of 11.345. These won't come up until the, the end. So very first thing, here's our data. Okay, and then we have our totals, and we want to write down our null and our alternative hypothesis. So go back to what we talked about in our null, our alternative at the beginning, and how we phrase those. Go ahead and pause the video and write down your null and alternative hypotheses. So remember, for the chi-square test for independence, your null hypothesis is always that the two variables are independent. So gender and music taste are independent, or not related to each other. Your alternative hypothesis are that they are dependent. Be very careful on how you word this. Music taste is dependent on gender or that they're dependent on each other. Gender can't be dependent on music taste. Your, your gender doesn't change based on your music taste. So these are your null and alternative hypothesis. For part B, we want to show that the expected value for a female who likes pop is 21. 
So we look at our data table here and we find females who like pop and we see that our observed value is 22. They want us to find our expected value. Given the data that we collected, the totals that we collected, what would you expect this group to be? So from the previous slide, we know that the expected value is our row total times our column total divided by our total total. So row total would be the total number of females. The column total would be the total number of people who said pop. And then total total would be how many people total were surveyed. So go ahead and prove this. Whenever you see the phrase show that in a question, they're giving you the answers. They don't care about the answer. They're telling you it should be 21. It, they're telling you show all the work that gives us that answer. Um, so our row total, the total number of females is 42. The total number of people who like pop, our column total is 40. And our total surveyed is 80. So we end up with, once you plug this in your calculator, you end up with an expected value of 21. The next thing they want us to calculate is the degrees of freedom. This is the amount of variabilities in our variables, how much can change. Um, and again, from the previous slide, it's the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one of the data, not including the totals rows. So just the number of different variables for gender and the number of different variables for music taste. So go ahead and pause the video and try that. So there are two different variables for the gender variable and there are four for the music genre. So you have two minus one times four minus one and you end up with three. This is also something that your calculator will tell you when we go to calculate this stuff. So for part D, they want us to calculate the chi-squared test statistic and the p-value. So we're gonna use our graphing calculator to do this. I'll show you in class how to do this, but um, you're gonna go to second x inverse, which is our matrix button. You're gonna go over to edit. And then I always just pick the first one, A, so hit enter. And then you have to tell it what size matrix this is. It's a two by four, again, ignoring the, the total rows. And then enter your data. So the first uh, entry would be 18, nine, so on and so forth. Then exit out of your matrix, go to stat, go over to tests, and then you want C, the chi-squared test, not the GOF, just the regular chi-squared test. Um, and then just keep everything the way that it says and go down to enter. Um, go ahead and try that. Again, I'll show you how to do this in class, but try that and see if you can get the chi-squared test statistic and the p-value. So if you do this, you should end up, if you read off the graphing calculator, the very first thing is your chi-squared test statistic, and you should have gotten 1.62 to three significant figures. The next thing on the list is your p-value, which is 0 0.654. And then the very last one where it says df, that's your degrees of freedom. So your graphing calculator tells you your degrees of freedom as well. Um, again, I'll show you how to do this in class, or you can search on YouTube or Google or something how to do this, um, but this will always be on your graphing calculator. So then using these values, you're gonna state whether we accept or reject the null hypothesis, given that they tell us we want an alpha level of 0 0.01 and a critical value of 11.345. So look at your chi-squared and your p-value, compare it to these, look at the previous slide, and decide whether we're going to reject or not reject our null hypothesis. So you don't have to use both, you can use either one. I usually use the p-value and the alpha level, but if we look at our chi-squared value, that was 1.67, and our critical value was 11.345, so our chi-squared was less than our critical value, or if you look at your p-value and your alpha level, our p-value was 0 0.654, which is greater than our alpha level of 0 0.01. So this is saying that the chance that any relationship between music taste and gender is random, is 65.4%. There's a 65.4% chance that any relationship between the two of them is random. And we set our threshold at 1%. So because there's a 65% chance that this is random and we set our threshold at 1%, we are not going to reject our null hypothesis or IB says you can accept your null hypothesis. Basically, gender and taste are independent from each other. There's no relationship between what your gender is and what your favorite music taste is. But these are the ones that you have to know. Critical value is less than, or excuse me, your chi-squared value is less than your critical value, or your p-value is greater than your alpha level. You do not reject, or similarly, you accept your null hypothesis. So this next example is comparing American bulldogs, which are classified by their height, um, pocket standard or extra large, and um, 
then Marius measures and weighs them. So he, he fits them into the three categories and he looks at the mean weight of these 50 dogs. So originally I was going to give you the data for all 50 dogs and you were going to find the mean weight. And then based on that, you were going to fill out the contingency table. I did that for you. Um, so there were 13 dogs that were classified as pocket. So but less than 42 centimeters tall and weighed less than the mean. Um, so there's our contingency table. So go ahead and do parts C through D. Write down our null and alternative hypothesis, calculate the number of degrees of freedom, and show that the expected value of extra large dogs that weigh less than the mean, so this group right here, is 8.16. Um, in this one, you'll have to calculate the totals. I don't have the totals written down, but you'll need to calculate the totals for the rows and the columns. So part C, null and alternative hypotheses, um, so our null hypothesis is that class of dog and weight are independent of each other. They're not related. Um, alternative hypothesis is that class of dog and weight are not independent. I didn't phrase this one that class of dog is dependent on weight because it's not technically, it's dependent on height. Um, but we want to see if there's still a relationship between the class of the dog and the weight. Um, so we're just going to say that they're not independent or that they are related to each other. Um, not necessarily that one depends on the other. Uh, degrees of freedom, so row total minus one, uh, number of rows minus one times number of columns minus one. So there was two rows and there was three columns. Um, so you end up with a degree of freedom of two. And then the expected frequency for number of uh, extra large dogs that are less than the mean. So I found the totals for the rows and the columns. There was 24 total dogs that weighed less than the mean times 17 total dogs that were classified as extra large divided by the 50 dogs that he measured. And so that's where you get the 8.16. So part F, you're going to use your graphing calculator to find the chi-squared value and the p-value. And then part G, comment on your answer. So are we going to reject or not reject the null hypothesis? Go ahead and pause the video and do parts F and G. So using your graphing calculator, you should find that the chi-squared test statistic is 13.4 and the p-value is 0 0.00125 to three significant figures. Remember, these zeros don't count for your sig figs. So then for G, comment on our answer. They don't give us our critical value, so we have to use our p-value compared to our alpha level of 0 0.05. So our p-value is 0 0.00125 and that's less than our alpha level of 0 0.05. So we reject our null hypothesis. The mnemonic device that I use is that P is petite, and so it's you want it to be small. Usually you're trying to prove that there is a relationship between two things. So in order to reject our null hypothesis or prove that there is a relationship, we want our P value to be petite or to be small. Um, so this three little dots here means therefore. So because our p-value is less than our alpha level, we are going to reject our null hypothesis, which means that the class of dog and the weight are not independent or that they are related to each other, which makes sense. Even though the class of dog is based on height, a bigger dog is usually going to weigh more than a smaller dog. So this has been an introduction to hypothesis testing and specifically the chi-squared test for independent statistical test.